annual Christmas event, some of which is taken up by society business. I'm Wes Ganaway, president, and uh, we have some of our board members here tonight. So we've got Gretchen, where's Gretchen? Right there, raise your hand. Uh, and we got uh, Janine in the back, she's the treasurer. Gretchen is our secretary. Got Donna, where's Donna? There she is. Uh, we got uh, Sue, yep, and then uh, we've got uh, Fred. Fred's here, yes, okay. And Kim, Kim, yeah, she's in the back too, okay. And so we're, we're only missing one person that's, uh, yeah, <laughs> Edward Dean Hubdi. Okay. And once again, we have our wonderful person from the museum. Okay. <laughs> He's keeping us honest. So I have a little bit of talking about the society before we get started on the program. And uh, the first one we're going to do tonight is board people. Now, I just mentioned all the board people. Uh, we're looking for replacements. So I would really like to have a show of hand if anybody wishes to be on the board. I do have one person. Thank you. And do I have, <laughs> uh, do I have any more? Uh, you want to be on the board? Oh, okay, uh, maybe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, she's in the back. She's also got stuff uh, for the genealogy uh, group. She's got some coffee, cup, coffee cups with a picture of our uh, old uh, uh, brick courthouse on them. Very nice. So we're going to talk, now that we've got uh, one one person that's volunteered, uh, I'd like you to stand up and give your name. It's not like he can get turned down, is it? So, with that in mind, uh, if we have no other volunteers, then uh, I guess we'll vote on the ones that are here. All in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> okay, thanks Jackie. All right, so it looks like there's a, a majority vote there. Thank you. So moving on, um, we'll talk about what's going on with the society this year. Of course, we're, we're getting out of the COVID thing somewhat. Um, we still have our main office in the basement of the old 18, or 58 Richards Building on E Street. Um, that's where we keep all of our books. We have our monthly board meetings at the Picket House now. So we have a larger place to sit and we also have an ability to pay them some rent so that they can have some money to keep the thing going too. This past year, uh, we've had a number of book sales, which is our big thing. And then of course, we've been publishing books, one of which is the journal. It's available tonight at the back. And uh, so if you had paid for your journal, uh, if you paid the $25, you get one with that. Yeah, otherwise, they're, fifth, they're $10 this time. Next time, they'll be 15 The prices have gone up. It now costs us $11 to sell a book at the bookstores. So that's why we're raising the price. It's $11 for that. That's on top of the, the money that, of course, it costs to produce the book. And then we pay about $7 a piece to have it printed. So. It's uh, gone up, it used to be $4 to print. I have uh, uh, 
and we haven't really done much in the way of promoting ourselves this year uh, as far as other programs and things like that. We do have the newsletter going out again this, during this season. Everybody like the newsletter? Yeah, yeah good. <laughs> so, um, I'm looking for specific people. Oh, they must have left. Uh, we had our uh, previous uh, journal uh, publishers here earlier and they've left now. I guess they came to get theirs. <laughs> so, uh, we have, uh, I guess, are you the only one, Dean, here? We're not, I don't see, oh, okay. So we have our, yeah, okay, Lane is here. They're the ones that are doing our journals this year. Thank you. All right, yeah, there you go. Got a little gal here, a future member. <laughs> okay, uh, one more item, and then we'll get into the talks. And that's it, it was brought to my attention that Lanny Little, who is, uh, keeps track of our online stuff, has been producing a number of films. And uh, <laughs> I went online and looked at the one you talked about tonight, which was the hamster, the belling hamster, is on most of them. You really gotta go on YouTube and see them. They're great. I just wanted to promote him a little bit there. So the final financial report will be out next month because uh, I like to include the whole month of December in it. So I'll have a couple of copies in the back for people to peruse. We've kept up with things this year, uh, and I'll explain that next month as to what went on there. So without further ado, we'll start our program. Um, our first one tonight is Roger Omskar, and uh, it looks like he's got something to do with our history here in the form of maps and stuff. Come on up, Roger. All right. I've got some props here. I'll pass them around as we go, go through. Yeah, I'm, uh, Roger Olmscar, I've lived in Bellingham now since 1971, or Whatcom County. I've lived out in the county a couple of times. And, I came up here in, in that year to take a job with the county planning department. The state government had just passed the new shoreline management law, and they, I just by chance heard about the job offering in Whatcom County, so I, I wanted to move up here instead of living in Seattle. I thought the traffic was bad then, but it's about five times worse now. So anyway, glad to, glad to have been here for that, that long. So I've been a land use planner and a land use consultant for the last uh, about 49 years. I retired now. And I was a member of this association three or four or five years ago. Yeah, you know, time goes by. And then I got really busy with work and some other obligations and had to just drop out. So glad to be back. Um, what I want to do tonight is just uh, talk about a couple of interests I have in, in local history. And to me, local goes farther south than Watkill. My mother was born in Snohomish County in 1908, and so I spent a lot of time there when I was growing up, uh, you know, moving, driving up there from Seattle on the old two-lane Highway 99. Can anybody here remember that? Going through Marysville, <laughs> okay. And uh, so I brought these maps along, uh, and I'm, the two parts of history I'm interested in besides Whatcom County in general, and I've read some of the older books, like Jeff Cott's book and some, some other ones that are very good. And I'm actually looking around for copies of those now and having a hard time finding them, even on Amazon. Uh, but I got interested uh, somehow a few years ago in the, the military road that was supposed to, was uh, uh, Captain Pickett was sent out here from uh, the East Coast in the 1850s, assigned to build a military road from Fort Bellingham to build the fort too, which they did. 
about 1854. That's not the exact year, I don't think, but but then they started building the road, and you might remember the, the, the fuss a couple of years ago about the picket bridge over there on DuPont Street, Prospect Street, so without getting into that. But I was already interested in it, and uh, I've looked at some of the, if you go on the internet and do a search, you find very little about that, the, the military road, or Fort Bellingham for that matter. There's, I won't say almost nothing, but not much more than that. It's kind of disappointing in a way. And I noticed in looking at some of the history books for the state of Washington and this area, there's not much, men there's either no mention of it at all or, or very little. And it was supposed to have been built from Fort Bellingham, which does everybody here know where, about where that was? Uh, where, about where, Smith Gardens, the big greenhouse complex out in the, uh, I'll call it uh, heading toward Marietta, is, that was the site the fort was built on. And uh, I'm told by the owner of the Smith family that there's virtually nothing left of it at this point, not a stick of wood of any kind. Uh, so anyway, um, so I'm, I'm working on that. And uh, also, as I got to thinking about that, and one of my missions, I, th I think I will eventually I would like to write a, a book about it, maybe not a very big book, but at least something. And I uh, got to thinking about that, and uh, I thought, well, all of the, the materials I've seen, none of them show where that road was actually built and whether it was actually finished all the way to Fort Stelicum, which is just south of Tacoma. That was the, the main fort in, on Puget Sound at the time, just south of Tacoma. It was a replacement for Fort Nisqually, which was uh, abandoned uh, at some point. So uh, my goal, our mission would be to tr do the best I can to figure out, well, where was that road actually built? And if you've been around SeaTac very much, you, you've seen pieces of the military road there that King County is, is using and maintaining and so on. But I don't know how much time do I have. I don't want to take too much time. Okay. We'll wrap it up here. So the other part of the story is um, my mother, as I said, grew up in Snohomish County in the Stillaguamish Valley, the lower valley between Stanwood and Sylvana. Everybody know, know where Sylvana is? Okay, good. So on a farm there that her family came out from the, the Midwest in 1902, bought a farm and she was born there a few years later. So I suspect if you've been on that road uh, the Snohomish County calls it the Pioneer Highway. Starts at, from the, this end about Conway uh, and then heads on down to I-5 just past Sylvana a few miles. So I think, I think that was part of the military road uh, for, some, for several reasons I don't have time to get into right now. But, uh, so those are my, my two main interests in history. And I brought a few maps along. Uh, I'm a, a, a map nut. I got interested in maps when I was about 12 years old. Uh, some friends gave uh, me a subscription to the National Geographic. And at that time, every uh, third issue quarterly, they would give you a map about four feet wide and three feet tall. <laughs> they don't do that anymore. But uh, I still have those maps. <laughs> and then I would uh, get on my bike when I was about, uh, before I could drive, uh, and ride around to the neighborhood gas stations in the Greenwood in Seattle, and I'd pick up road maps. They give, gave them away at, at that time. They were all free, <laughs> so I still have some of those. And uh, so I just fell in love with maps, and frankly, I'm disappointed in a lot of history books of all, all topics and ages, in that a lot of them are very poor on maps. They, they just, I don't know what, they just assume that you know where places are or you have an atlas at your fingertips or whatever, but I'm disappointed in, in a lot of books and articles I see about the lack of maps. So let me get my exhibits here. I want to say this, uh, I joined the Washington State Historical Society and got this nice magazine in the mail a couple weeks ago. It's about $35 a year for a single person, and 
boy, if this is what you get, it's really worth it. So I don't mind passing this. I'll pass that around right now. There's, a map, there's an article in there about a, a map of Washington State, or at least Western Washington, and I've not seen it yet, uh, but I hope to see it someday. This was one of the first maps I, I got that's a historical map. It's a map of uh, Blaine, the, the Lummi Indian Reservation, and Bellingham's over here. In fact, Fort Bellingham is, was located right in here. So this was this piece of paper was published in 19, about 1907, and it's a one inch to a mile on this. They didn't uh, mark the section numbers, which is too bad, but we have newer maps that do that. But I'll just pass this around now. Well, you can buy maps like that at $25 or so. You can find them on the internet. I'll start this one over here. This one is uh, the Sandwood area that I was just talking about. And my mother's farm was right, right along in here. Without putting my glasses on, I can't find it. But there's a little black dot in here that is, was their house, which is not there anymore. Or else. I didn't see it over there. Wait. Now, those are the two different scales of, uh, no, I guess those are the same. And this is the new, I don't have a map of the, uh, that on that map, the scale is one inch to a mile. The government, federal government started producing those around the end of the 19th century nationwide. So I, I do have a couple that are in that age group. This is a map of, um, shows you what, what you get nowadays. It's called the seven and a half minute series. Uh, scale on this is one inch equals a uh, thousand feet. So you can buy these, uh, you can easily buy these updated copies of them. So this is a uh, Ferndale, yeah, Ferndale quadrangle. Yeah. So when I worked in the planning department, I really got into using those. Now you, can, you can find those online too. And finally, uh, I. A few years ago, the, you know, the Western Washington had a map library in the basement of Arts and Hall. Anybody ever go to that? Yeah. Okay, well that's gone now, as you know. They wanted to use that space for something else. And so they moved all those maps over to the Wilson Library. And there were so many, they decided to have a big giveaway. So there was a, some publicity. <laughs> and that whole, that big library room up there they had maps all over the place, different stacks by different subjects, areas. So I went to that and I picked up a couple of maps of Wisconsin. This is where my mother's family uh, settled from Norway when they emigrated in the 1840s. Yeah, I can't pinpoint it on this, but this is a map of that part of Wisconsin. And this is also a one inch to a mile. I have a couple of those. You, you, once I got into this, this in the last year or so, I was uh, amazed at how, uh, how many of these maps are for sale out on the internet. There's vendors all over the country that, that have maps of Washington State. <laughs> and this is really surprised me that they were not available. Okay, I think I'm, uh, I'm done at this point, so any questions? Did you drop something? You stepped on it. Oh. <laughs> oh, okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. Is anybody else? Surely somebody must have a talk here. <laughs> no? Nobody's got a project? Come on up, Lee. Yeah. So I'm Lane Morgan, and um, you have my first effort as um, editing the journal. With, oh, Mike. Do I just need, oh, there. That's working now? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. 
that's because of Dean, who's an old friend, and talked to me about maybe doing it. And it's been a lot of fun, thanks to help from everybody, especially Dean. And I want to thank Wes and Janine and all the contributors who are here, like Candace. And I'm excited to work on the next one. Um, I'll say briefly, I've, I've lived in Whatcom County since 1980. Um, and 20 years in Sumas and just over 20 years in Bellingham. So I'm kind of divided up between the county and, and town. Um, I think I'll just, unless people have questions about things that you've seen in this journal already, you haven't had much chance to look at it. I'll just mention that planning for the next one is, um, Surprisingly to me, well underway. We've had a number of pieces submitted that we didn't have room for this time, and it is our intention to, along with the price rise, to make it bigger next time, and I think that will be, that will be doable given the interest that people have in contributing. A um, couple of the stories that are coming up should be um, on the Stickney Indian School, which is one of uh, native residential and day school that some of you may know was out in the Stickney Island area near Everson. Um, unlike the notorious boarding schools that we're hearing more about lately, this one was um, on property that was donated by a Nooksack Indian tribal member and done kind of in combination with the tribe and the um, Methodist church. So it has a different kind of history then. And um, what else? We have a uh, story. We are hoping to do quite a bit of focus on the North and East County, which gets written about the least, we think. Uh, we have a story in on, from Larry McPhail, who's on the board at the Linden Pioneer Museum. And he has, a, he has custody currently of a homemade World War II tractor when tractors and tractor parts were being requisitioned for the war, a lot of farmers, or a number of farmers anyway, um, converted their pickup trucks to a tractor that could plow and, and harvest. So he used to see that and play with it when he was a youngster out in the county, and now he's the person who is in charge of it between the times it goes out to be in parades out in Linden. So he's written a nice story about that. Um, we have a st story on, um, from John Harris, who's a professor at Western. Some of you may know him in visual journalism. He's working on one on um, some Darius Kinsey negatives that have, I don't know what is specific about them to make them interesting beyond what we already know about the Kinsey narratives, but John will know. <laughs> um, do you, do you remember? I think I feel as if I'm forgetting one, Dean, that we've already talked about. I'm uh, interested, maybe, perhaps, doing another author Q and A with uh, local, uh, local history books, such as um, the current journal. Yeah, with Candace. Candace Wellman's here tonight, um, and her book is coming out from WSU Press in the spring. Is that right? March to April, so we get a preview in the journal before the general public knows as much about it on um, the notorious Mr. Fitzhugh. And that was an interview by, by Dean. We also, Dean and I are hoping to do a little more to feature locally relevant books as they come out, maybe little capsule reviews or at least descriptions. So we would love to hear from people if you run across someone who's self-publishing something or just a book that you have seen that's on its way. Um, that would be great to, to let us know because we'd like to have a little section on things that are in print that aren't necessarily by the Historical Society. And my mind is going blank on the other. Oh, Todd Warger says he has a story in mind, but I don't know what it is. Um, but <laughs> I'm sure it will be fabulous. So that's really it. That's the preview from me. Um, and I'm excited and happy to be doing this and eager to hear from any of you who've got ideas of what we should be up to. Thanks.
Anyone else? Oh, oh, okay. We have the... <laughs> Thank you. My books are here. <laughs> if you haven't already known that, <laughs> my book is here. There they are, Deb's holding up. Rock and Roll in Whatcom County, 1955 through 1980. All the big names, a lot of small ones. A whole bunch of venues. There was venues that didn't even know existed until we got almost done with the book, had to keep adding pages. Um, he's not here tonight, but I really want to thank Steve Smith. He really helped us out because he knew a lot more than we did about it. <laughs> and uh, he supplied us with a lot of information. He was a DJ for years and he owned K uh, KBFW. And uh, so he really could come up with some good photos of a lot of the people who played an important part here. One of them, uh, well, the, the basically the radio stations probably are one of the major reason, reasons why rock and roll got going. You had a couple back east, uh, they started doing uh, a lot of uh, rock and roll and it just kind of spread. But here, of course, we were much more uh, I don't know, uh, old fashioned, you might say. <laughs> so we had uh, a little bit of problem trying to find out, well, who was the earliest here, what happened. The earliest one was in 1957 when the uh, DJ at uh, Gary Bruno, you ever heard that name? Uh, he played about six hours of rock and roll on a station that was uh, actually uh, coming out of the uh, Washington, Western Washington College at the time. And so that was the first one that came out. It was really a lot of information in the book. Uh, I'm really proud of this one. It's, uh, it's got almost 200 pages of constant rock and roll stuff. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, well, Deb and I, you know, we sit there, we both went to Ballard High School, we would listen to uh, Pat O'Day. Yeah, <laughs> I just see some play, yeah. Hey, yeah. Hey, <laughs> Dive, yep. Okay, she's got it down. <laughs> yeah, they, uh, he had radio stations all over. He owned them, he ran them, he had, uh, uh, he was in charge of uh, a couple of big outfits that uh, were, uh, all these major, major bands and, and singers uh, had contracts with him and they would uh, scatter them all over. I don't know how many of you got to Village West at Birch Bay, but uh, they had a lot of big name bands there and of course they played in other places. One of the places that had the most bands, of course, was the university. Yeah, they really had some good ones in there. The one that I think it, he points out uh, was the fact that uh, about the night that uh, Pluto's had the guys in the uh, Volkswagen bus, there were a couple of hippies. They smoked a lot of dope. And then <laughs> they went up to Western and uh, made a presentation, and within about a month, everybody at Western was a hippie. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I talk about Deb and I going to the, uh, the uh, movie theater next to Pluto's, and uh, you can almost hear the noise from Pluto's next door. <laughs> it was pretty good. Anyhow, um, if there's nobody else, uh, you guys want to... Uh, no? We're, Okay, I'll, I'll, I've got uh, Candace coming up. Huh? All right, thank you. Yeah.
wasn't going to say anything tonight, but then I realized if I publicly say what I've been thinking about doing, maybe that's what I need to get, you know, the boot in my butt and do it. So, um, yeah, my book on Fitzhugh comes out March, we think. It could be March, early April, and then I'm going to do the program, I, from what I understand, in April about it. And, um, yeah, it, you probably have heard of Fitzhugh because he and Ed Warbus got the contract to build the military road here in town. Um, and Ed Warbus is an interesting character. You, if you've seen him before, he's out on San Juan Island, and he's sort of an, a hero out there, and an old, old settler, and in the pictures with his beard. He is hated in Cowlitz County. And I didn't find this out for a long time, and then they're talking about what a horrible person this was, and I'm like, Ed Warbus? And, but he's got this completely two different things going on. But anyway, what I'm considering writing about is James Forsyth, who was uh, Pickett's lieutenant here, came from West Point to here, to Fort Bellingham. And uh, his wife, Mary, was uh, Swinomish. And after he left, and he was one of the guys who actually did abandon his family here, his wife and daughter, uh, and went to the Civil War, and became the commander of the Massacre of Wounded Knee while his former wife, daughter, and six grandchildren were sleeping at Lummi Reservation. She went on to marry Chief Henry Quina. Um, but all the stuff that has been written about Wounded Knee, none of it, none of it ever addresses who he was personally. He was with Sheridan from the Civil War till Sheridan's um, retirement. He founded a cavalry school at Fort Leavenworth, and he took over his best friend Custer's old regiment, and that was part of what happened at Wounded Knee, was revenge. But n nothing I have ever found says anything about who this man was here and that he had a native family. And his daughter, Teresa, became Lummi Reservation's first school teacher, and she was the mother of half of the Finkbonner family here. So there's plenty of Forsyth descendants right here in Bellingham. So uh, I've, over the years, I've talked to the South Dakota Historical Society three times at big history conferences and proposed this project. And they always go, oh my god, kind of. And you know, go ahead and write it, get it to us. I've never done it. But the files have been brought into my office. They're sitting there. So I'm kind of thinking if I say this tonight, that I'm going to write an article about this guy, that I will actually do it this January when there's nothing else to do. You think so? Yeah. My other alternatives are C.B.R. Kennerly, who was a Smithsonian naturalist here with the Boundary Survey. And I have enough stuff to do a full biography of John Tennant to replace the inaccurate one that was done by Jeff Cott, sadly inaccurate. And um, I have another one that I've got enough stuff to write another book on, but I, you know, I don't know how long I'm going to keep going. So um, I, I'm going to do Forsyth. I'm, I'm declaring it. I'm going home and doing it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Any more? Yeah, okay. I always thought that Highway 9 was a military road. Was it what now? Was that military road? Highway no, Highway no. no. Um, the military road left here. It went through Sehom. It went down, and as far as I know, from what I've heard, it went down through the woods to the, to the, to the, uh, to Chuckanut Bay. 
and that was the pioneer. The Civil War stopped all the funding for it. Yes, it, yeah. So yeah, they did just a few miles of it. Yeah, it just ended down there somewhere. Um, and the, 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 it was actually more of just, uh, you could ride a horse on it was about it. It went down, uh, the pioneers started using it, actually made a wagon road. That was the only road out of here for years. There, you, otherwise you had to take a boat. And, uh, and then of course when they were doing the surveys, uh, for the, uh, uh, you know, the, along the water there for the uh, uh, interurban, they took out the road, and then of course there, a lot of it was taken out because when Great Northern came and moved their tracks over to the water side, I, I don't know. That's just kind of what I've heard. Yes. Yeah, one of your meetings a few years ago, uh, I think it might have been on the military road, and there was a leaflet handed out, a nice little piece that somebody had done. No, I, well, somebody gave us a talk here, what, four or five years ago? I'll, I'll, I'll see if we have it. We have a copy of all, oh, yes. Hey, Wes, didn't Jim Berg do something? Who? Jim Berg in one of his books, didn't he say, he had some photos and something in the military world, I thought. Yeah, I don't, I yeah, I don't remember, yeah. My memory, you know, it's a 75 year old brain. Okay, anyhow, um, yeah, anyhow, there's a lot of work to be done there. Um, well, there's you know, a lot of information out there just in bits and pieces. So I guess we'll just uh, call it an evening. I do have some photographs on my computer if you want to see them. Is anybody really interested in that? They're, okay. <laughs> I've got 11 of them, and I'll just tell you a little story about each one. Is that okay? All right. Yes. Oh, yeah, I've got one more thing. Okay. We're going to talk to the program director here. We finally put in place some programs for the, the spring. Um, next month, Troy Luganbill is going to talk about bird. There, bird. Troy Luganbill is going to talk about a bird's eye view of Whatcom County using Google Maps, and he's kind of a local historian. So if you don't know or have not heard of him, uh, that should be pretty good. Fe February, <clears throat> Wendy McLeod from out in the county is going to talk about Whatcom historic places, just an, an overview of all sorts of different places, and uh, March. Uh, a lady named Mary McGoffin is going to talk about Northern State Hospital called Under the Red Roof, 100 Years at Northern State Hospital. And then, as you mentioned, Candy is going to be up in April uh, on uh, Edmund Fitzhugh. So just wanted to give you a quick synopsis of uh, some upcoming programs. Thank you. Had a discussion here about Fort Bellingham, and here it is. Ta -da. So, sometime in 1858, there was one of the uh, adjutant generals came up here, did a survey of Fort uh, Bellingham, and drew a uh, picture, drew a plan of it. Then he, he went up and he worked with the uh, the border people, the surveyors, for a while too. And uh, you can't really read it too well because I copied it off of a copy. But it was 200 feet on a side, so it covers about an acre. Uh, you see where the two uh, uh, the little towers were? And uh, so what we're looking at is, of course, the bluff. The bluff, it was the only cleared spot along the bluff, and it was perfectly uh, set up there. You could get down to the beach, and a boat could come into the beach and go up the hill you know, on that trail. Like you'll see right here. Um, and I don't know what this was because 
it was probably just a footpath, pretty much. It was the beginning of the military road. <laughs> uh, and Warbus was the, uh, the settler. In other words, he, he bought and sold stuff for the fort, and, and uh, he was in contact with the people in town. Uh, they built this in August of 1856, and then uh, they moved on to bigger and better things. They went, uh, started constructing the road. Now, everything that was done in, in the, on the bay was done by the people they hired from towns. A lot of people in Wacom and Seaholm helped build the road and the bridge, the picket bridge, the original one. So he really, he was a pretty busy guy. He, yes? Would you orient me? Where's the bay? Where's the water? The water's on the left. Yeah. The, yeah. They, uh... Foresight through that map. What's that? Foresight through that map. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. They uh, they had this. Of course, when they took uh, when they went over to San Juan Island during the beginning of the Pig War, they took one of the uh, uh, he took this, a bunch of fence, a couple of the buildings. The buildings were built pretty ramshackle. Uh, you had the uh, officers' quarter was the only decent one, and it was uh, shipped over to, I believe, uh, over to uh, San Juan Island, too. It became something that somebody lived in or whatever. Uh, the, the, a lot of the fencing was still there later on. A couple, one of the farmers nearby there used it to keep his cows and whatnot in. It was burned in the uh, 1890s, and either one of the big forest fires we had burned it, or they said a hobo spent the night in there and caught it on fire. So. Oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay, we're talking another map. This is the map take, take, uh, play, that shows the, uh, the area in 1846. So I'll, I'll break a few things out here. Um, uh -oh, there, Rupert's Land, it wasn't called Canada. Everything west of uh, Hutchins Bay was called Rupert's Land. Prince Rupert owned it. And uh, he actually was the guy who got the charter for the Hudson Bay Company in 1660 or 50, somewhere there. And uh, so the headquarters was on Fort Victoria for the Hudson Bay Company. And in the fall of 1858, uh, they got their charter. They, he was in big trouble because he, he demanded that everybody coming through there buy a license to go up to the gold fields up, uh, up on the Skagit Upper uh, Rivers. And so uh, that he wasn't supposed to be able to do that under their charter. So they took the charter away, but they made him the governor of the new province. <laughs> and so then Fort Langley was the, the headquarters for the uh, British Columbia for a long time. Uh, the only other things on here, this was all called the Oregon Territory, and uh, it was always named that. As far as I know, it was considered a separate thing. The, uh, the United States, of course, they claimed everything here, and they really wanted everything up to here. But uh, that was that uh, 54, 40 or fight thing that one of the presidents yelled about. Eighteen seventy-three. Look familiar? Huh? That's downtown Bellingham. <laughs> so what you've got here? Here's the old brick courthouse behind the Whatcom Hotel. You've got a bunch of houses on Division Street here, and this is the the uh, the bay, the mouth of the uh, Whatcom Creek. It was all water. There was no shore. Uh, nothing. So where is it today? The shoreline's out here. That's a lot of dirt, right? <laughs> what they did, they washed down the hill. There was all just a big bluff here. 
and they, they hosed that all down. They did that in Seattle, Tacoma, Port Angeles. They just hosed everything down to make so you could go up. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and they did a lot of infilling too. They, they would block off a, a part of the bay and then they would backfill it. They would take a, a, a big pump and they would suck up sand and gravel from the bottom of the bay and dump in behind there and make land out of it. Did that with most of the waterfront. So if we had a really bad nine, uh, you know, earthquake, then of course uh, that would all turn to jello. <laughs> they think I'm kidding. 1973. Okay. How about 100 years ago? <laughs> In 1873, this is the first, and uh, probably the first photograph taken that we have today. We know there was photograph people here earlier because it's mentioned in one of the old newspapers that he came and took pictures of the families. Some of them had been married for years and they wanted a photograph of their marriage. Well, they had kids with them in the picture. So anyhow, uh, there, okay, hey, that works now, okay. That's what drew, he's good. Um, here's the court building. If you could see this a little clearer, now this is actually a contact print from whatever they took the picture with. Um, you, you'll see some supports for the wall because the tide would wash up underneath the building and undermine the brick wall. So they supported that. Here's the Wacom Hotel. It was torn down about 1913. Uh, here's the white building that was talked about here. This is where the original uh, paper was printed. It was also the first schoolhouse, not the one at Seaholm, but here. This is uh, uh, Edward Eldridge taught school here, private school. This is the picket house, it's up on the hill. This is the gully here that it came up and went up Seth Street now. Here's a bunch of building. One of these is the Eldridge cabin, I believe. Maybe that one, so, something. Anyhow, it's supposed to be up here. That looks like a, a regular log house. This was, sure looks like the, op, uh, the headquarters building for the mill that was down at the mouth of the creek. And uh, if so, then the creek ran down through him behind these buildings and came out here. The mill was gone, so it's after July when they had to fire. This is Division Street here. That's going to burn down in 1883. And Division Street would be now in what would be an alley between C and D streets. Here's an 1850 map. Actually, it was redone uh, a lot, uh, many, several years later. Here's the seas. This is the dock coming off of the Colony Mill. That's the Colony Dock. It went way out there, about 1,500, 1,600 feet to get out of the muck and sand to where a boat could actually pull up and, and uh, pick up lumber and stuff. So this would be the site of the original mill. And as you see, now the shoreline comes out about like this. And uh, so there's a lot of buildings there, right? <laughs> 1880. Yes? What's that uh, thin line out in the water? Is that flood flats? Is that city boundary? Do you know what that This line? Is that the line? Is that, is that the line you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's probably the navigational shoreline. You know, it's all mud flats. Yeah. They had this, uh, when they, in 1858, when they had the gold rush, of course, they platted all of this. It's the Sea Home and the, and the Whatcom. And they platted out. So you got Holly Street was 13th Street. Remember that, okay? So 13th Street uh, was on, uh, when they did finally build it, it was on planks over the water. So everything from First Street on up didn't exist at that time, but uh, it does now. It's 
So here is the biggest event to ever happen in Bellingham. It's the day that the, the Great White Fleet came to town, May 19th, 20th, and 21st, 1908. I like this picture because of this guy. <laughs> He's down that Prospect Street runs down in here somewhere. This is the corner of uh, Holly and uh, uh, Cornwall, what we call Cornwall today. It was called Dock Street back then. A lot of these buildings are still there. Not much, no wood buildings are there. Uh, they, they got replaced by brick. We were the, one of the, we had more brick buildings in town than anybody else. And they all burnt down and we only had a few burned down. So you had 7,000 men off of eight battle, uh, seven battleships march through town on a Saturday. You had 100,000 people here watching them. There they are lined up on the street. They came up onto the dock down, two docks, one down at Fairhaven and one down at the south end of Boulevard Park. They marched down or up along State Street all the way down to Ellis and back and then came down all the way to G Street, turned around and went back up. So that was the big deal there. Nice. You see the people over here on top. <laughs> they didn't, you know, oh, look, <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's the fleet out here. For 50 cents, you could take a boat ride out and get on one of them battleships and walk around. They had the sailors out there kind of doing their thing, telling you all about it. I wish I'd have been there. <laughs> Lummy Island in the distance there? Uh, oh, Wait. sorry. Yeah, back in here. Is that it? Yeah. It's, they, uh, they came in, steaming in, black smoke you could see for 50 miles. And I always thought, you know, why are they trying to hide? They, paint, they would paint them different colors to match so that they couldn't be easily identified from a distance. And here's this column of black smoke. They burnt coal. <laughs> so, yeah. When World War I started, they, they took several of these over there and they, used, they were used to move uh, troops are back and forth and uh, things like that. They weren't really used in battle uh, because the limit, there was a limit on the amount of coal that uh, they used. What's that? Are you talking about this? Oh, well, this? That's uh, probably the foot of Cornwall. Yeah. Nineteen forty-eight. Everybody knows what's going on here. They were building ships for the navy. This was the uh, uh, Bellingham shipyard, and uh, they built. Quite a number of ships, uh, mostly minesweepers and then uh, a few of the others here. And uh, that's Squalicum Harbor, okay, this, this area right in here. It is in 1998. Now it's BCS, Bellingham Cold Storage. Look at the hundreds of boats. Second largest marina on the West Coast, as far as I know. Yeah. Eighteen seventy-three again. So the mill is burned. Here's the bridge. That's the picket bridge. The new one's going to be closer to the edge of the bluff. So as you know, as you go by there, you can look down. These buildings were here. Uh, they had finally, by that time, built a stairway up. Uh, there was a period of time when this bridge burned, and they had to go over by the, uh, by the old, past the old courthouse building, walk up on the ridge, cross over on the picket bridge, and then come back down the other side. So they, they, there was a big article in the paper, could you please, please get the bridge repaired? <laughs> and uh, so this was, uh, this was the heart of Watcom, pretty much. 
by then, of course, there was no, much, not much industry here. It, it burnt down the mill. Uh, they hadn't really started fishing much yet. Uh, they, there's a cannery or two, that's about it. Um, they didn't have a mill big enough to cut the logs. Now you think about a mill that was the size of your house, cutting a log that was 30 feet in, in circum <laughs> circumference, and uh, you know, it, it just wasn't gonna happen for a while. Not till mid-1880s when they got uh, the uh, Big saws and the, you know the, the steam-operated equipment. Yes. Who's really charging the force now in that photo? Uh, is that is that because this predates uh, the, the control dams up at Lake Watson? Is that why it was flowing so, so loud? Yeah. Yeah. There was. Uh, they had. Okay. There was a dam built right up above here, right below the bridge. There was an, actually a dam built and they could, they could operate it. And what they had was, they had a pipe that came out the side and it went down in a, in a, uh, a, a pipe went across here and then from there it fed into the mill operating systems. It was all run by water power, the Pelton wheel, things like that. And so that's what turned all the saws and whatnot. And so, uh, you had that whole area flooded when they, uh, it, there's pictures of the, in 1912, when the guy went up in the balloon and he took pictures of the city. And you can see all the big lakes piled up behind where the city hall is now is a lake. So, yeah, <laughs> Whatcom Creek, because they couldn't depend on the uh, steady water flow without that, without that water. Oh, is that it? Okay. Okay, I think this is it. Yeah. So you're looking at an 1854 drawing of Seaholm and Watkin. Can you see them? Okay, here we go. Here's the Seaholm. Here's the Seaholm dock. Here's Watkin over here. Here's the middle. Not much there. There's a couple of buildings along the, the beach. They couldn't build anything up on the hill worth, you know, that would indicate that it was a town. So they did everything on the beach. And of course, that, uh, that presented some problems <laughs> during bad storms and whatnot. Like I say, they had to support the outer wall of the, uh, the brick building because it was starting to give away. It, waves would come in and wash out underneath. That's Mount Rainier. I mean, Mount Baker. Jeez. I don't know why I'm thinking about Rainier. Uh, uh, and it's, it's a pretty good drawing. Uh, there's a couple others that, uh, one that, uh, the one of the mill that's down at the mouth, they did from up on the hill above it. And it's sitting out here in this lower part of the outlet of the creek and there's no water coming over there or anything like that. So, it's, But it was enclosed. They show it as in, being enclosed. Now in eight, 1923, when they did one of the tulip festivals in a parade, they had a, one of the, uh, thing, you know, the little the things that they had people on, what, uh, the uh, floats, and it was all, you know, it was a, they had a car pulling a trailer with a thing on it. So. That was a model of the mill, and it showed it as being open. In other words, all it was was a roof over, or like a shed roof over. Uh, and so it's hard to say which was which. But I do know they had circular saw, it wasn't a straight blade, because of the markings on the wall of the picket house inside. You can see the original woodwork, and it's got these big, where that went through. Yes? yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Where did this come from? This is one of uh, the, the two guys that drew the pictures for the uh, survey. Oh, okay. One of, seen yeah. That. That's you guess here, February of 54. So to have several buildings up there at Sea Home and a little dock. Yeah. This must have been drawn probably six months later at least. 
Yeah, in August, I think that's when they were here. Because they kept expanding the dock, but at first there was hardly any dock there at all. Yeah, we well, remember the one I have in the middle, and in the background you can see a building across you think is through the longhouse. Yeah, yeah that, that was drawn at the same time. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That's the earliest known picture of that area. So we have, we have somebody that was here, the survey ship, they, they worked all over the area, redid all of the, uh, the uh, area, took all the new surveys and stuff, which was, uh, you know, there was, uh, uh, Vancouver was here in 72, 18, uh, 1792, <laughs> and then uh, Wilkes was here in 1841, but I don't know that they did a lot of survey work then. It was mostly done in the 50s, 1850s. Where, where did you find this? It's online. It's online? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> there, uh, I've it, never seen it. If, uh, I'll send you the information. It, it's one of the colleges back east has all of the drawings oh, from yeah. the survey. Wow. So, yeah. Well, that's all I have. So, has anybody got any questions or answers? <laughs> Well, thank you all for coming. Oh, I got one. Did we need to talk about what's coming up next month? Uh, I did. You did it? Okay. Then we're <laughs> I was out talking to somebody. Okay, thank you. And we'll see you next month. Yeah. Well, in front I, of a chapter if I know. So I thought it was Fort Bellingham, and then I got to look, and that was more than one building. So then somebody said that. They said, oh, no, that's Seaholm. So... Um,